Well, I invite you to take your New Testaments this morning or your Bible app, open them up to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, as I said before, man, I'm just so glad uh, to be here with you this morning. We really did uh, miss you. Had some great opportunities uh, uh, to worship with some other folks. Uh, just filled us up. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, there's just no place I'd rather be uh, worshiping with God's people than right here at Bethany Church. And, and again, just thank you for um, the way that you, you're so generous and expressed your appreciation to Don and myself and gave us a great gift. Uh, you probably know we, uh, we went to Hawaii. Uh, first time we'd ever been to Hawaii, and um, and I just I, all I can tell you about it is is awesome. It's just awesome, and it was everything we would have expected it to be, and so much more. And, and just the way it, it it worked with the timing and everything. Not only was it our 25th anniversary here to, to serve at Bethany Church, uh, but um, we also were celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary, and. Uh, that's, this is really for Donnell, uh, because she's responsible for us making it 40 years. I can promise you that. Yesterday was the actual date of our anniversary, so it was a rather anticlimactic day. But it's a day for me to remember. This is what we looked like 40 years ago when we got married. And, uh, and, uh, and I have to tell you, that's a, this is my favorite all-time picture. And, um, and, you know, we weren't very old. Uh, because you couldn't be very old and put on a t-shirt like that and, and then stuff it down into your gym shorts and dress alike. And, uh, but we just thought we were just big stuff. 40 years. That happened to be Disney World uh, down in Florida. That's where we went on our honeymoon because that's where children go on their honeymoons. And, uh, but now 40 years later, here we are. And uh, there, we are in, uh, there we are in Maui, and uh, Donna, they got the one we, they didn't get your picture. Oh, she didn't want this one. We had another one. But this is great because, uh, oh, oh, not that one. I, I don't, uh, well, we, we just enjoyed, I'll go, uh, that's fine, that's fine. This is where we are 40 years later. But once you know, we uh, experienced uh, all the adventures, tried to be, uh, uh, not to show our age and do everything exciting. So we, we did every adventurous thing we could do from hiking there in the rainforest. So here you go. Now, here we are even out snorkeling there. And, um, and, and it was just awesome. Now, you know, over the years I've shared with you uh, about our honeymoon. And, um, and 40 years ago, going down to Florida, and I probably got that, you're not very old and very smart. Uh, I, I got severely sunburned. I mean, it, this was a bad deal. I was sick and didn't want anything touching my body. You can't think of anything more horrible on your honeymoon than me screaming out, don't touch me. And that's how, well, you know, this is what you don't want. But it was just horrible. I've told that story. So some of you guys uh, were so nice. And you just tell, you know, boys, we're getting ready to go. It reminded me, hey, don't forget the, don't forget the uh, you know, the sunblock, uh, you know, sunscreen. You know, some said you, need, like, might, you might need SP 100. Uh, that was awesome. I know you guys are doing that. Some of them gave me some. That was great. And um, let me tell you about it. And I took your, you know, I'm, I learned. So I, I use sunscreen. I'm kind of a novice at this. I tan pretty easily. But there's areas in my body that have never seen the sun. And so this is what happened. Oh, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, that, and your response is exactly the response I was getting every day I went out walking in my sandals. People would look down there and go, oh. And, uh, and I'm not kidding you one bit. Uh, but uh, you think your guy would learn. I just, you, it, there's an there's a, uh, a application, a spiritual lesson, and sermon illustration, all that. Sunscreen only works where you apply it. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. It was so much fun. Well, you know, uh, getting ready for today, I was just thinking, what a difference a year makes. I mean, one year ago, I can even remember the service. We worshiped that day. It's a big celebration, summer day, but we worshiped in the gym and had the big tent, and, and uh, it was just a great day. But also remember where we were. We were just uh, in, in, the, in the heat of the summer and right in the middle of a heated and hot political campaign, a presidential campaign like um, we have never seen in the history of our country. 
And so we were going through this campaign as a nation, and, and, uh, and, and, and we didn't know what was in store for us, what was going to happen. And um, I, I ran across this. It was so amusing uh, to me. Um, this is an obituary that appeared on, um, in the uh, Richmond, Virginia uh, Times-Dispatch um, in May of last year. It's obituary for a, a lady named Mary Ann Nolan. And this is how her official obituary was printed and how you'd read it in the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Quote, Facing the prospect of voting for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, Marianne Nolan of Richmond chose instead to pass into the eternal love of God on Sunday, the May 15, 2016, at the age of 68. And, uh, and now, uh, I don't know what Marianne would have thought about all the results, but uh, for those of us who are left alive, here we are now, about six months into a surprising President Trump's administration. And, uh, and the fun just continues. And, uh, and we've never seen anything like it. And uh, our nation, a lot we could say about it. And, um, and so I, and I don't by any means tend or want to make any kind of what would be a partisan political statement here. But we do have a president, and, um, and it's our duty as believers to pray for him and all of those who serve us. I don't know if any of you watched it last night. I'd seen it advertised. I, I, Don and I watched it last night. It was um, the, um, it's called the Celebrate Freedom Concert at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. last night. Uh, that it was led by the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, and other area churches. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, but um, I, I was just uh, I was just moved by it. the whole uh, and I the whole concert, the whole event. I'm sure you can go back, you can find it, probably be replayed. But the president spoke, and um, and and just here's just my opinion. It was absolutely the best I'd ever heard him. Now you may say, well, the bar's not too high, and the bar may not be too high. I agree. But I uh, I was quite encouraged. And, and blessed by what I heard that evening and uh, how he honored veterans in that service, which is, that was the intended um, purpose of the concert and his speech last night. And it was in his honoring of the veterans. I appreciate how this president speaks and champions religious freedoms like uh, we've never seen in a long, long time in the history of our nation. And his uh, best line, in my opinion, is something he's been saying the past few uh, months even, but you may not ever hear anything about it. But he made it quite clear when he said, in America, we don't worship government, we worship God. And uh, it's just outstanding. I appreciated it so much. I encourage you, if you didn't see it, to see it. And, um, and to pray for our nation, pray for those in leadership. And, uh, and that's, you know, today, Tuesday, uh, is the 4th of July, Independence Day. It's a particularly significant uh, American holiday and celebration. And when you think about the 4th, of course, I think about food and cookouts and, and, um, and all that's happening, about fireworks, and of course, I think about freedom. And um, what I want to do is take the few moments we have today and think about those freedoms. And, and I want to direct you to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. You, you might notice uh, in, in your Bible, uh, and Bibles are all different. This, this isn't really part of the biblical text, but uh, there'll be chapter and even paragraph uh, divisions in titles, subtitles, headings that are there. I find them to be particularly helpful. It kind of gives you an idea of what is being talked about in the, the, the passage of Scripture that follows that particular heading. In my Bible, you know, and the publishers of the Bible, that I have, they, they inserted this particular heading at the, at the right at the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and that break that they made there, and they just entitled this section, Living Godly Lives in a Pagan Society. And I thought, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great sermon title. 
Uh, that's a great challenge for us as believers. Living godly lives in a pagan. Now, pagan's a word that we don't use and banner around too much uh, today. And, uh, but it's a word that means basically unbelieving. It's a word uh, that, that means something to be opposed to. It, it, it's sort of the idea of living in this post, and not just post-Christian, but anti-Christian culture and society. Living a godly life, you might even say, in modern-day America. And so how do we do that? And so we take some ancient words that are just as relevant today than they were over 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Peter, the fisherman, wrote them. And, and this is what he wrote. And so follow along in your Bible and the text with me. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. That's interesting. Uh, and I probably just preach as I go along. He, he's saying aliens. Uh, not illegal aliens, but you're, you're not a native to where you live. So I urge you as, uh, well, as aliens to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. There's a reminder that we are in a battle, and it is a royal-pitched spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. And at stakes is your soul and all of our eternal destinies. So he says, as you wage this war, verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans, the unbelievers, those who are anti-Christians, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, though you haven't done anything wrong, they're still going to accuse you for doing wrong. They may see your good deeds, and as a result, they will glorify God on the day he visits us. And so our strategy in this battle is we just live good lives. We live godly good lives that are so different that those who even hate us have to stop for a moment and say, man, there is something different about them, something admirable about them. Verse 13, he says, submit yourself to the Lord's sake, to every, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority. And that's the message of the scripture. We're people under authority. Government is that authority ordained by God, created by God as our government. And so you live under their authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and, do, and to commend those who do right. So he's talking about the role of government and what its boundaries are. And then he says in verse 15, for it is God's will. Everybody wants to know what God's will is. You know, it's the number one question that most all of us ask. I wonder what God's will is for my life. Well, we, we're given God's will in general ways all through the scripture. So this is God's will for you. It's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Can I just add here, this is just my two cents. There is a whole lot of foolish talk. A lot. I mean, just turn on your television, and uh, you know, and just listen to it. And and it's just it's, it's so much of it. You can't even begin to sort all out anymore. Just but it says for you in the midst of all this, here's God's will. Just keep doing good, and you finally you're going to shut the people up by just living such good godly lives. It's hard. It's difficult. It's not in our fleshly nature to do that. But he says, verse 16, live as free people. And we're free people. Nobody is more free than you and I are. In this entire world, nobody is more free. And yet in the freedoms that we enjoy that are given to us as Americans, many of us find ourselves caught up in a spiritual bondage that is more binding and confining than, uh, than being in locked up in a physical prison itself. But we have this freedom now that's been given to us. Live as free spiritual people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves under authority. Live as a slave with a master, and it's God himself through Jesus Christ. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. That's God's will for us. 
I like how the message paraphrases verses, uh, verse 13 and verse 17 where it says, Make the master proud of you by being good citizens. You know how to make God proud of you? You be the very best citizen of the United States of America that you can be. And God will be proud of you for being a good, good citizen. Then he says in verse 17, the paraphrase, treat everyone you meet with dignity. I'm not sure as the, as the church we have always lived up to that one. I know I haven't, and I have to repent of it. I've had to repent, and I and, and constantly repent of that. And can I just add here, and this is just free stuff, where I see people being treated with less dignity than anywhere I've ever seen before is in social media. And as a believer, we have some responsibility of what we post and what we say. Treat everyone with dignity. Love your spiritual family. Meaning, it's just assumed if you're a believer, you're part of a spiritual family, we call that a church. And so love your church. Be part of the church. You get into the church. Man, you, you, you sacrifice, you serve, you give, you do that. Love your spiritual family. And get this. Revere God. Respect the government. Revere God and respect the government. Uh, so right there on your outline, what you can write right there at the top of that is this statement. Every Fourth of July, I, I, I take hold of this. I mull it over. I think about it. And that is, we can be unashamedly patriotic and unapologetically Christian. Matter of fact, we can be and should be patriotic Christians. And these two things are not diametrically opposed. As I mentioned, we do not lift the flag above the cross. And our ultimate allegiance always lies in the cross of Jesus Christ. But we are told we are to what? We are to revere God ultimately with all of our allegiance. There's no second. But then we say we are to respect the government which God has established, which means that we can be patriotic and, 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 and we, can, we can celebrate within the means of that deifying uh, our nation and uh, our military, be it thanking God for what he has blessed us with. So what I want to share with you this morning are three important words for patriotic Christians that I think will, will help us live in, as, as godly lives in an anti-Christian some post-Christian, anti-Christian, pagan uh, society and culture. And so this is the first thing I want you to remember. We kind of look at it in this sense, past, present, and future. So let's look at the past. We look at the, the history of our nations. It's always important on the 4th of July. First of all, we need to remember our foundation. Remember our foundation. And so I'll give you one word to hold on to. And that word, I think, could be resolve. You know what resolve is? It's this, this unflinching commitment, this never quit that you are resolved. And, you, and, and there has to be this kind of resolve that takes place. And in this context, we, we remember our past. We look at our history. And we look at the solid foundation upon which our nation was built. Psalm 127 one says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And so, this is what I, I would share with you, just maybe a little brief spiritual overview. And I just, this blesses me, probably even more than it probably blesses you. Uh, for me, during the, 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 this time of year, to, to go back and do just a, a little spiritual background study and reminder of who we are in our history. It, it, it's sort of like when you, you look into your your DNA, and you go to Ancestry.com, and you look at your family tree, and you, you kind of want to know, well, you really don't even know who you are unless you can kind of get an idea of where you came from. And so you, you want to look back into that. And this is sort of an Ancestry.com, and we get into our spiritual DNA collectively as a, as, as a people and, and for our nation. 
1620, the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. They signed a document that was known as the Mayflower Compact. This is how that document began. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. I mean, this is 1620. Almost, let me get my math right, 1620, you know, it's getting close to 500 years ago. For the advancement of the Christian faith. Our forefathers came here and settled in America for the stated purpose of advancing the Christian faith. The first college established on American soil was Harvard University in 1636 for the, for the stated purpose of training Christian ministers. The rules and precepts of Harvard read, quote, let every student be plainly instructed. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Let me remind you, that's Harvard University. It's still open today. And that's how they started, you know, close to, you know, 450 years ago. And uh, in 1776, the colonists declared, declared, uh, declared independence from Great Britain. And the Declaration of Independence begins with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Endowed by our Creator. The acknowledgments of God and these rights are, are given to us from this God. They did not emanate from government, but from God. The first president of the United States, General George Washington, said, It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. It's just impossible. Abraham Lincoln noted, I believe the Bible is the best gift God ever has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. You know, one of the arguments that, that, that we hear so loudly today comes from, from a pluralist worldview that says because we're such a diverse society, it is intolerant to continue to try to impose Christian morality, Christian beliefs, Christian anity, Christianity on, on others. Patrick Henry, one of our founding fathers, over 200 years ago wrote, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum. Prosperity and freedom of worship here. He knew what he's talking about. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they knew that the, the freedoms, the truths, everything they established in this nation on came from the truth that the, of the foundation that established this nation. But it just continues on. You know, you say that's a long time ago. You're going back 400 years. You're going back to over 250 years ago. How about as the 20th century, just 100 years ago? In the early 1900s, President Woodrow Wilson said, quote, A nation which does not remember what it was yesterday and does not know what it is today nor what it's trying to do, American, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of holy scriptures. And that's the great progressive Woodrow Wilson. He even knows that and said it. But then you get over to the Supreme Court, which seems to be a whole other bailiwick that's going on over there. And which, by the way, if you were ever to visit the Supreme Court or any other really significant building or monument in Washington, D.C., you're most likely to see inscribed on all of those in stone the words of the Scripture. And right above the benches of the Supreme Court stands words from God's law, the Ten Commandments. And so it's just etched in stone right there. The U.S. Supreme Court decreed in 1930, not even 100 years ago, that we are a Christian nation. In 1952, the court stated, that's when now we're, we are getting into our own lifetimes. We are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Even the, even Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, one of the most liberal of all the judges in the history of the Supreme Court, wrote in 1954 in Time magazine, quote, I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have, have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. The good book. 
the Savior. Jedediah Morris is one of our founding fathers. He predicted over 200 years ago when he wrote, Whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government, all the blessings and all the blessings which flow from them, must fall with them. In our history that we know the foundation of which this country was built upon. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. And you want to know why we are in a constitutional crisis today. It's not because who's sitting in the Oval Office. It's not what's going on at Capitol Hill. It's because it was intended to be written for a people who knew their foundation came out of Christianity and the truth of the Scripture. That's the only way it will work. He wrote, for democracy to work, the majority of, for, the major, to, for the democracy to work, the majority of people have to be religious and moral at their core, or it falls apart. And so there you get a little idea of what's happening. Maybe you want to know why is this happening? And we begin to see what's been happening here. And you begin to listen to this. And, it, and it, I think you could say, looking to history, it go on and on and on. And it's just, it, 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 there's, without just being blatantly dishonest, there's no way you can deny why this nation was founded and what our foundation, what our history has been. A few years ago, Peggy Noonan, who was at one time a speechwriter for President Reagan, now a columnist today, she wrote a column called Making History. And she reflected on some of the events that led up to the adoption of the Declaration of Independence in, in July of 1776. And she remembered a time that she had visited the home of George Washington Mount Vernon. And she went there to listen to historian and the, the great author, David McCullough. And he, he was speaking about the influence of George Washington. And then she asked the renowned author and historian a very important question. This is what she wrote. She said, I, I asked him how he accounted in his imagination for the amazing fact of the genius cluster that founded our nation. How did so many gifted, true geniuses walk into history at the same time in the same place and come together to pursue so brilliantly a common endeavor? To which David McCullough replied quite simply, I think it was providential. In other words, God made it happen. Providential. And we apply that word providential to American history. And I think we can say that, that this is a providential nation. And it doesn't make us better than anyone. God doesn't love us more than anyone. It just places upon us a tremendous blessing that comes with tremendous responsibilities along with those privileges that are given to us. But here we come to understand we are a beacon of liberty and hope for all of the world. And this is, in America has been God's gift, I believe, to, to, to the world. And it didn't happen by chance, but it happened by the hand of God. That's providential. And that's why we celebrate the 4th of July. You know, Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount when he preached, he, he said in Matthew 7, he, he said there, Matthew 7, 24, he says, if, Therefore, if anyone who hears these words of mine, therefore, anyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. You know, it's not enough to hear them, but then you've got to do them. And so you put them into practice. But man, if you put them into practice, you take that truth, you live by it. He said, you're like, you're like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And, and so here we have a foundation of our nation firmly on the rock of faith in who we are and what, he, and, and what God has given us. And that historian was, was interested, had asked an interesting question several years ago. He, he, a historian just asked the question, why is it that life in North America has been so fruitful and abundant while life in South America has been so oppressive and poverty stricken even to this day? And you begin to see the parallels of what happened in North America, particularly the United States of America. You look at in South America, uh, roughly uh, uh, discovered, uh, everything begins about the same time. They get the same natural resource. You be, what, what, what's the difference? Why, why, why did this happen here? Why is it didn't happen and it's not happening there even to this day? And as he searched it out, he answered his own questions. because This is what he said. Because the Spaniards went to South America in search of gold. The pilgrims went to North America in search of God. That's the truth. That accounts for the difference. 
And what we've seen that happen. And so I think there's one way, maybe one word to me that best describes America's birth and beginnings, and that is the word resolve. Our forefathers had tremendous resolve, an unflinching commitment. They weren't perfect, they weren't all Christians, and but yet they had to resolve to the commitment to the truths of an ultimate authority and an absolute truth that they believed was founded in God's word, the scriptures. And they were, un- they were unwavering in their commitment and their resolve to that, not only in their spiritual foundation, but in the sacrifice that they were willing to make for them. You know, when we knew, Don and I knew we were going to be going to Hawaii and, and, and it had this great opportunity. We'd never been there before. We didn't know if we were going to go back. We knew we were going to spend most of our time over in, the, in Maui and doing all kinds of fun stuff and just having a blast. But uh, as we talked about it, said, you know, we can't go to Hawaii and, and not go over to Oahu and begin our trip there and, and see Pearl Harbor. I, and I felt like I would have missed something if we hadn't done that. And, and so we did. And, and so uh, we were able to go to, to, to Pearl Harbor and to, to see that. Went to see the, Oklahoma, the memorial for the battleship Oklahoma. And we were proud Okies that day. And, and then we went out. And, of course, you go to the icon, iconic uh, memorial for the battleship Arizona. i got a picture for you here of it. You've seen this picture. You've been there. And you probably know this. This is a, a, not just a United States uh, memorial. Uh, monument but it's a memorial it is a active cemetery and the bat uss uh, as, uh, arizona was was sunk on um, on december the 7th 1941 attack on pearl harbor it was only one of the battleships in battleship row that was not raised and i didn't know this you know they raised those battleships including the oklahoma fixed them and put them back into service there's a spiritual lesson there for you uh, but the Arizona, they didn't raise because Arizona took a direct hit. And it just blew up uh, the ammunition uh, that was in the, in the, in the, the hull of there. And, and, and really, and, and you, you, you see it. Oh, there's this I did, above, above. You can see the outline of the Arizona there. They left uh, over 900, I believe, sailors are interned there. And that's their resting place. And the reason they didn't bring their bodies up and identify them is they were unable to because of uh, the explosion that took place. It's an incredible, sobering experience to be there. I'll forever be affected by it. And to, to know what happened that day and the attack. You know, Donnell had the privilege uh, a few years ago to visit our missionaries over in France, Robert and Judy Bryan, and, and they live up in the, they minister up in the northern and northwest part of France. It's only a couple hours from the beaches of Normandy. So we went to Normandy when we were there. And it kind of came full circle for me and because... Uh, Started there, but ended in Pearl Harbor, knowing that I'd been there. What uh, now standing just a few weeks ago at the site that really began World War II for us as Americans, but going to the place that marked the end of it, where the invasion of Normandy D-Day took place on uh, June the 6th, 1944. There are almost 9,400 soldiers buried in the American cemetery, not the not just Allied, but just the American cemetery there in Normandy. I was forever and will continue to be forever moved by that. The sacrifice uh, that was given and that represents. It represents the resolve of of a great nation and and should for us speak to us uh, the resolve we should have as not only Americans but as faithful, believing followers of Jesus Christ, Americans. Greg Larry is one of my favorite authors, pastor out in California. He wrote, as you look at our country and you look at the statements of our founding fathers, as we've done just briefly this morning, he says, consider that many of them were Christians. They at least had a respect for God's word, and they believed it to be an authoritative source. They believed it in a person and a power of Jesus Christ. If we remove that foundation, if we remove this, that belief in the Bible as God's word, what we have is a vacuum, and that vacuum is, has been created. And it continually, it, it, the truth is being sucked out of it. And suddenly, this whole American experience begins to unravel. 
And so there we have We've got to remember our foundation, remember the word resolve. Here's the second thing, and that is we, we need now we come to the present and we need to recognize the crisis. And then I don't think anyone here would, could deny that, that we are a nation that has been in a cultural revolution, an upheaval, that at least you can go back and even document many in our lifetimes of experience from the 1960s and to where now we are living with the result of all of those things that um, began to, to be the revolution that was taking place within our culture. And now we live with those in the early part of the 20th century, and we see what's happening here, sort of that unraveling it feels to, uh, and, and, you know, to begin to experience here. And we see uh, really um, the, 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 the crisis, you might say, the cracks in the foundation. Here's a word. The word is relativism. Relativism. I've already alluded to and talked to. It's basically and quite simply the belief that there is no absolute authoritative truth. What's true for you may not be true for me. If it works for you, that's great. It doesn't have to work for me. We just kind of create our own truth. Kind of like it was in the days of the judges in the Bible where everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And so we, that's the day we live in. And so now we, we're living in this culture now, in the present day, where you see the coming of the foundation of the truth and the moral and spiritual decay. And, uh, and, and by the way, our, our state has been in, the, in the, the focal point of the national news these past few uh, days and weeks uh, down at East Central University the, on the campus of, uh, down at Ada, Oklahoma, at the campus of East Central University with a group trying to say they have to take the cross off a chapel there. And so there, you know, you, you see some of the results of that. Several years ago, a publishing company, Wilder Publications, they began printing uh, together copies of the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution. You know, that's a great idea. They take the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, they print them together. That's kind of awesome. Uh, but the problem was that they sold the Declaration and, in, and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, put them together, and put a warning label on them. And so this is the warning label, which read... This book is a product of time and does not reflect the same values as it would if it were written today. Parents might wish to discuss with their children how views on race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and interpersonal relationships have changed since this book was written before allowing them to read this classic work. That's just to me an enlightening observation. It's true. Those views have changed. And I would encourage every parent to sit down with their children and discuss race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and interpersonal relationships. And maybe what has changed and what hasn't changed in our culture. But it's the height of political correctness to kind of insinuate that our forefathers, they really didn't know what they were talking about way back then. And we are so enlightened and times have changed. And as a result, we experience this revolution we find ourselves in. I think the best word for me to describe the past 50, 60 years, six decades, uh, is relativism. This, this relativism, the, the absence of moral truth that happens here. John, 6, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Seems to be maybe one of the most exclusive verses in all the scripture. Yet Jesus says, here is the foundation. I am the truth. And by the way, the truth sets you free. And freedom is rooted in truth. And then not only do we find that in Jesus Christ, but which this verse is an anathema in this pluralistic culture and society we live in. But 2 Timothy 3.16 then says, God's gift to us in the scripture the Bible tells us all Scripture is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true and good and make us realize what's wrong or right. In other words, the Bible tells us how to live such good lives in an unbelieving, pagan, post-anti-Christian culture. This, tell, the, this is how you, you, you live the truths of this book. This is how you live that good life. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaching us to do what is right and wrong. But the problem is we live in a world where no one knows what's right, no one knows what's wrong. But the consequences are great because there is a direct correlation between a, mor a nation's morality and its stability. I believe it was a great historian, Toynbee, 
But it made the observation that in the history of the world that 19 out of the 22 great world powers have all fallen, not because of forces from the outside, but because of inner decay on the inside. And my guess is, whatever the future of this great nation is, and if it were, God forbid, that we fall, it won't be because of a power attacking us that's greater than us. It will become from the inner decay and rot that comes on the inside. That's our problem. There's no one in the White House, no one on the Capitol Hill, no one on the Supreme Court bench that has the power to change this country. The power to change this country is found within the church who call upon God and the power of God to come as we repent of our sins and we come face down to him. Deuteronomy 8, look, it says, it's Deuteronomy 8, 19 and 20, it says, if you ever forget that the Lord your God and if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, okay, worshiping and bowing down to him, you leave God, follow others, you will certainly be destroyed. I mean, it's just there. No questions asked. You know, if, you, if you do that, this is what's going to happen. Just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path, if you don't learn from history, he says you'll also be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God. So he lays it right out there for us. This is what we can expect. I love Proverbs 14, 34, and the message that says, God devotion makes a country strong. God avoid, avoidance makes people weak. Man, that's a great word. You ought to cut that one out, print it, put it somewhere. God devotion makes a nation strong, family strong. Uh, it, it makes people strong. God avoidance well, it just leaves people weak. And, and so there we see that word there. Now the final truth I give to you today. Now we move towards the future. And I, I'm not going to take a lot of time here. I, I just give you the, 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 the point here. It's the restoration of our nation. I may have to come back and, and we'll speak more about it. And here's the word. And I won't give you a word yet because I know what you're thinking. You know, if you follow along with the preacher, first word was, was, was what? Resolve. You know, second word was relativism. Just so you'll know, if, you've, if you tried to go ahead and figure out, it's not Republicans. Okay? Just so you know, it's not Republicans. It's repentance. And here's the key. It's not something that, 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 that not in it, not every one of us would know and to, to realize. It's repentance. We, 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 we are people of hope. And, and we see that it's, that, 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 Really, we, we see, we, the, you know, let me tell you, when you see hope the best is in the face of hopelessness. And I'm, I'm by nature, I think, a pretty optimistic person. But I tell you, I, I find it hard sometimes to work up much optimism for the future of this nation and not think it is too late but then I catch myself knowing how God works, saying, you know, it, it, I, that I got to quit wonder, hoping that someone else does something. I've got to uh, not wonder about, I got to worry about what, what do we do as a church and as a pastor? What do I do as a, as a believer and follower of Christ, as a husband, father, and grandfather, father? And then, then I know that, that it's not hopeless. First, Second Corinthians seven fourteen. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from them, and from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their nation. And there you see the hope that we have in that. And it's not political action, which is important. Involvement is critically vital for believers in, in, the, in the political arena. And I wish we had more believers that were involved in what produces culture in our nation, from the government to education to the entertainment. And I uh, wish many of you would be involved in that. And you take your faith there. But ultimately it comes down to God and our connection with him through prayer. And there's a humbleness that comes. If my people called by my name will humble themselves. Not, not all the other things that come along, but you begin right with yourself. Humble yourself. Humbleness then is really the, 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 the precursor of holiness. And because there's no humbleness... There has been a real lack of holiness in our culture, in our country, that is nobody else's fault but yours and mine. That our lives don't show any distinct difference than someone else's life who does not proclaim and walk and follow the name of Jesus Christ. That's our fault. 
And so I've tried to determine, instead of wringing my hands over what the president may tweet, and, and he needs a little help with his tweeting, I know, and, uh, and what the legislatures are going to do up on Capitol Hill, and I'm, I'm encouraged and hopeful for the Supreme Court, I can't do much about that and just exercise all of you as an American citizen, but I can make a difference in the holiness of my life. And I can pray if I'm willing to humble myself to do that. 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says, I urge you then, first of all, that all petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings as presidents, and all those in authority, legislature, Supreme Court justices, every level, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And so we have our marching orders that are given to us. We are to, to humble ourselves and to pray and to trust God. Remove pride, and you can't pray if you're full of pride. We are to love God and to love others. It's the greatest commandment given. First is to love God. Second, just like it, love others. We are to speak the truth in love. We are, we are to be truth speakers, moral pillars, but we are to do it in a compassionate, kind way, which, is, which I think we, we've lost our winsome way as believers. And, and how we do that is, is the challenge for us. But we love God, we love others, and we take a stand. With the resolve of our forefathers, we hold our ground, we, we hold on to the truth and with, with, with humble, repentant hearts, you know, Psalm 20, says, 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, some trust in their 401k, some trust who's ever in the White House, some put their trust in a political party, some put their trust in a mighty military. But he says, we just trust in the name of the Lord our God. And come hell or high water, we trust in God. And we don't give up. We don't quit. We take a stand. Where it says, and Peter said in Acts 5, 29, you know, if you're down to the choice of obeying God or obeying man, the choice is clear. We must obey God. And there in the civil disobedience that comes with that. And in the essence, what he says, you've got to be different. You just have to be different. Let me close with this verse. Philippians 3.20 says, we are all citizens of heaven. As followers of Christ, we have dual citizenship. I just love this. Paul says, you know, I'm a citizen of Rome. He exercised his right as a citizen of Rome. And when he wrote Philippians, he ended up in a Roman jail. But he said, I'm a Roman citizen. I deserve better treatment than this. I have certain rights as a Roman citizen. He claimed those rights, exercised those rights. He got thrown into jail for it. But he also said, you know, I'm a citizen of Rome, but I'm a citizen of heaven before I'm a citizen of Rome. We're citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return is our Savior. That word, that word citizen, it's just a neat word. It's the, it's the word in the Greek that we get our English word politics from. And so, you know, you might be a registered Republican. You might be a registered Democrat. You might be a registered Independent. You might not be anything a Libertarian. It could be I don't care, whatever it could be. But when it comes down to the politics of all this thing, I have to remember I'm a citizen of heaven my politics come from there. I'm a political animal. The politics of heaven, living as I relate in politics, just means how you relate with other people. And here's where our politics are. So let me just close. I, I, I kind of want to close maybe just a little differently this morning. I know the musicians are going to come. And we're going to worship you. we got time. Remember, i got lunch for you, okay? we got lunch. I, I, I want to we'll pray for us. I, I'm going to, to pray for us. I'm going to pray for our nation. Abraham Lincoln offered this prayer back in 1863. And if you know that's a pivotal, pivotal point in our nation's history in the Civil War. And I'm going to pray and, and read for you that exact prayer that he prayed. And, and then I'm going to ask you, I'm just, maybe you can stay seated if you want to. But if you're physically able to want to, you, you, may, you may want to stand. And you can go ahead and stand now if you want to. But then I'm also going to ask you if you're physically able and want to do it, you may want to kneel. And so I'm just going to kneel right here as just a, as a posture and a symbol of humility representing all of us and in, in myself to humble ourselves before God and to pray this prayer that Abraham Lincoln prayed 
And I'm just going to ask you just to get as low as you can. To be as contrite as you possibly know how to be. In reverence to God. And so you may want to bow with me right here at these altars right here at the front. And these steps right where you are in the aisles. Or just stand or maybe right there at your seat. It doesn't matter because it doesn't really matter what anyone else does. It's just whatever you feel led to do. And, and we pray. And so Father, I offer this prayer up to you that you know, was prayed over 100 and, almost 150 years ago by one of our nation's greatest leaders. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved through these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten you, O oh God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God who made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power and to confess our nation's sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. And Lord, here today in 2017, may we do the same. May we say this and and may we mean it. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated and take a stand. But just uh, take a seat for just a, a moment. And just want to wrap it up by saying, uh, like Teddy Roosevelt, this is all I want to say. Teddy Roosevelt once said, I hold up the Bible to my fellow countrymen. And I, and I want to hold up Christ as the hope and the Savior of the world. And, and, and that's what we have to say. And it's hard to believe that the President of the United States once said that. So maybe it's time for you, to, some of you, you here today, to compare, declare your spiritual dependence and, uh, and, and, and give your life to Jesus Christ and find true freedom in Christ. And maybe some of you say, I want to be part of this church family. I like what's going on here. I want to be involved in that. And I want to make this my, my church home. Whatever decision you want to make this morning, we're going to stand together. Go, I invite you to stand again. Joshua's going to come. We're going to worship.